do politics around here and local th- local stuff, but we're going to do local crime stuff today. Um, I have in studio Jerry Tillinghast, who is the subject of the book we're going to talk about, and I have the writer of the book, Joe Broadmeadow, uh, who's joining us as well. So this will be a great, great interview. I've had them both on before by telephone, and as you know, telephone isn't the perfect way to conduct an interview like this because I can't let you take calls. Just the sound doesn't work. But we're going to take your phone calls, and we're going to have uh, Jerry and Joe are both going to be here for till noontime. Okay, so we're going to have the entire two hours. So we're going to develop the story, talk about the book, talk about Jerry's life, and we'll take your phone calls as well. So if you want to get on the line, and the lines are going to fill up quick, you can, but you will have to wait for a bit. It's 508-996-0500. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Joe. Morning. morning, Chris. All right. So, we, as I said, we've done this before, uh, but it was on the, it was on the phone, and and I think it's, it's better here in the studio, folks. We also, if you're not able to catch this entire interview because you know you have a job and you have to leave and come and go from your car or, or your office, um, we will put the entire thing up on YouTube, so you will be able to catch the entire interview up on YouTube uh, later today, and we're streaming it live on YouTube. So, if you want to take a look at these two gentlemen. Uh, and not me, you can on the WBSM YouTube site. The name of the book is Rage, Regrets, Redemption, Choices. You make them, you own them. The Jerry Tillinghast story. What I'd like to do first is speak with you, Joe, about Jerry and about you, you're discovering this thing and, and, and about yourself. Now, this is interesting because you're a retired police officer and Jerry is a retired Criminal. Criminal. That's Jerry saying that, right? Um, <laughs> so choices you make them, right? You own them. So, um, Joe, talk a little about yourself so people understand where you're coming from on this. Oh, well, sure. I'm a retired captain from East Providence, Rhode Island Police Department. I was there for 20 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, this is actually, Jerry's book is the uh, fifth book that I've written. The other, uh, three of the other ones were uh, non, were uh, fiction novels. Uh, That type of story. And uh, I knew Jerry, of course. I knew the name by reputation. And uh, and I also knew him because my father had been on the state police in Rhode Island, uh, probably had arrested Jerry, uh, (laughs) along with some of the people that Jerry used to associate with. So, you know, I had a background on what Jerry was all about. If you're in Rhode Island law enforcement or Massachusetts, New England law enforcement, you knew the telling hasts. Of course. Yeah. I mean, organized crime in Rhode Island and, and New England, for that matter, uh, you know, it's pervasive. It was pervasive, certainly in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, Raymond Patriarca, who headed the New England organized crime family, was known throughout the country. He was uh, well established in that that well, in organized crime. So, yeah, if you're involved in law enforcement, you had to know about the mob and and their reach. Uh, the way I got involved with Jerry's book was uh, Jerry's attorney Paul DeMeo, who had represented Jerry in a number of different cases, one of which was bonded vault, a rather significant case in Rhode Island, the largest heist, one of the largest heists in uh, U.S. history, uh, contacted me because Jerry had been working on a project with a, with a reporter who had since passed away, and they wanted to know if I'd be interested in picking up the story. So as I, as I delved into the story, uh, it became more and more interesting. Obviously, the organized connection, crime connection is interesting. The bonded vault trial is very interesting. The way Jerry was, was arrested, the, the murder case for which he was convicted, was a rather significant case. But what really t- uh, made the story interesting for me was Jerry's experiences as a Marine in Vietnam. I think that that's crucial to the story, and, and you, you play it out in the book. But one, one of the parts is, first of all, because you're from law enforcement, it's one thing when the subject of the book makes his claims about make any they make their claims about time of war and things like that. but you you looked at the documents you 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 verified the information you you know what the jerry actually was in vietnam that he actually served in the marine corps that he served with when honor and valor and got screwed by the government that's right what I, one of the deals one of the arrangements that i made with with jerry and, and paul when we discussed doing the book was that i wouldn't put anything in the book that i wasn't comfortable uh having it in there something i could that my name was associated with it i wanted to be able to back it up so one of the things Jerry talked about was that he had gotten um, unfairly treated as a result of an incident that happened in Vietnam. And I was able to pull 
the military records from the Judge Advocate General's office, the Marine Corps Historical Do Archives, to get at the actual copy of the case. And I was also able to locate a guy by the name of Mike Hanlon, who was a, at the time, uh, a first lieutenant in Vietnam. He was a JAG officer, a a, uh, an attorney, who represented Jerry in the initial case. And by the time I had contacted Mr. Hanlon, Judge Hanlon, he was actually retired. He was the retired presiding justice of the California Court of Appeals. He had a very long and distinguished legal career. And when I, when I asked to speak to, to, to Mr. Hanlon, uh, he didn't know what it was I wanted to talk to him about. I just uh, let him know that I wanted to speak to him about an old case. Uh, as soon as I mentioned Jerry's name, Hanlon, uh, Judge Hanlon was able to recite the case, almost chapter and verse. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that this is a case that happened in 1965 in Vietnam. And Hanlon obviously would have handled thousands of cases as both a, a, an attorney and as a judge. And he told me that there were three cases in his legal career that stuck out in his mind, one of which was Jerry Tillinghast's case. And that was significant to me because he was, he reinforced what some of the documents showed was that the uh, Jerry's conviction was not justified by the evidence. It was really driven by the fact that there were 12 Marines that were involved in the platoon and in, in the uh, squad that went into this village. Two Marines who actually committed the rape of this Vietnamese woman. Jerry's only only uh, involvement in the case was the corporal ordered him to untie the woman. So that's why the woman got to look at her and got to look at Jerry. And he uh, refused to give a statement to the Marine investigators. And that stems from his upbringing in South Providence. He was brought up in a culture where to cooperate with authorities, to give a, you know, to essentially to rat out on somebody was a, was a, was a fundamental violation of their code. And so he didn't do it. So of the 12 Marines that were there, and two of which permit, you know, committed the rape, 10 other Marines were involved essentially as witnesses. Only one other Marine was charged. And Jerry actually received a more severe sentence at the con uh, on his conviction than the two Marines who committed the initial, the actual rape. Ultimately, part of his sentence was reduced, but nevertheless, he served a year in uh, Portsmouth Naval Prison um, after having been in Vietnam. And and as a sideline, I, I you know I was able to review Jerry's military record as a Marine while he was in Vietnam, and his he was an outstanding Marine. He was rated very highly by his fellow Marines, by his commanding officers, by the NCOs that he worked for. He was someone that they relied on. He was a machine gunner. Uh, which is a very important aspect of any of any uh, squad or platoon. They're, they're the guys that really can can uh, defend a platoon when they're under attack. And Jerry was well respected, and they relied on him quite a bit. As all of that played out uh, in my mind to corroborate that um, Jerry really was mistreated by the court systems there. So when he comes back from Vietnam, he ends up in Portsmouth Prison, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Portsmouth, New Hampshire, naval, okay. The naval uh, prison was located there. Uh, when he's released, uh, essentially, he is now a convicted felon. Uh, the Marine Corps, uh, the skills in the Marine Corps don't transfer necessarily well, you know, especially combat in Vietnam don't necessarily transfer well into civilian life. Mm -hmm. There's somewhat limited opportunities. And he ends up uh, at a place called the Bronx Tap. Uh, his father actually brought him in there. Uh, and that Bronx Tap was a facility, a bar that was owned officially by someone else, but was essentially run by a guy by the name of Gerard Wamet, who was an up-and-coming, up-and-rising star in, in organized crime as part of the Patriarca family. And Jerry's, uh, you know, the, as we say in the book, choices, uh, you know, Jerry had choices to make. Sometimes the, at that time the choices were somewhat limited, and he ended up, you know, hanging with the wise guys and, Getting involved in a number of different incidents, so that's how that's how that whole story progressed. We're speaking with uh, Joe Broadmeadow uh, and Jerry Tillinghast about uh, their book, "Rage, Regrets, Redemption: Choices." The Jerry Tillinghast story. You make them, you own them. I, I have to tell you, folks, I have read the book. I have interviewed these gentlemen before. This has got to be on your reading list for the summer. Run, don't walk to go get it. Uh, everybody I know who I've recommended the book has thanked me for for picking the. You know, for picking the book and interviewing these gentlemen, and having encouraging people to go read it, you you will you will very much enjoy it. You will recognize a lot of the names in it: John Gotti, Raymond Patriarca, uh, 
Jerry Wilmette, to just name a few, Nikki Bianco, all of the the stars, so to speak, of the of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even 90s um, are in this book. The stars of organized crime are, are in this book. Uh, Jerry, how did you end up in the Marines? I uh, actually because uh, when John F. Kennedy died, I loved the guy. I just felt that I wanted to get even with whoever killed him, and I joined Marine Corps for that. One of the basic reasons. Another reason was <laughs> I was riding with a friend, and he had a stolen car, and I was charged with it, and I had to go to to court for that. And uh, I went to the Army once. They said they can't get me out. I said, all right, I'm going to Marine Corps. I joined. I said, can you get me out of here by the 31st of March? They said, yeah, we can. I said, you got me. And that's basically what happened. I tried to beat the system, but I wanted to get away. But, right, you know. right. Right, so so then you 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 go to training, you're you're, you're an infantry marine, all well, marine I guess are infantry, right? But yeah. you, but but well. you were really in the infantry, and you end up in Vietnam. But you end up in Vietnam because you want to do a couple of things. What did you want to do in the Marines, and then you ended up volunteering to go to Vietnam, right? Well, I, when I first joined, I joined under the impression that I was going to be uh, learn how to operate heavy duty equipment, right? And uh, that would have been beneficial for me when I was. Be- come out of the Marine Corps to work at a business or whatever. But they handed me a rifle that's the heaviest equipment you're going to have and you better get used to it. Nah. <laughs> that's why I wound up in, in the infantry and got stuck there. But it wasn't bad. I mean, it was what it was. You know? Yeah. But. So you, up, so you go to Vietnam. What, what, what was it like in Vietnam? Scary. To a point. In other words, after going through everything that you go through, if somebody came back from Vietnam and said they didn't have at some level a certain amount of fear. See, fear up there can feed your adrenaline. That'll keep you going. Not fear the fact that you're afraid of everything going on, but the fear that, you know, it's just there. And it makes you want to do what you're supposed to do. It makes you stay alert, pay attention to what's going on. And uh, I remember when we first got there, uh, we come out of the plane, the, the airship was under fire. And the second day, I said, what the hell did I sign up for? Because I volunteered to go. You know, I was at uh, Quantico, Virginia. I was an uh, instructor for the second lieutenants coming through their boot camp. We were teaching them how to use weapons and stuff like that, camouflage and stuff. And uh, it just wasn't me. I, I don't know. I know I wasn't uh, a mess up all the time, but I just didn't like that. I, I wanted something more. Okay. And, uh, she said some. Tell me to Vietnam. Well, I volunteered to go ahead, yeah. you know, because they don't just send you uh, right. at where I was. Okay. I had to volunteer to get out of there. Because right. we were right at Washington, D.C. I, you know, I got tired of them people. I just wanted to go, you know, you know, I can't. I was going to, uh, I'm going to make it a, an exception now. I was warned by Chris that <laughs> I have to watch my language or he's going to beat me up and throw me out of the <laughs> studio. So uh, I just want to. If it does slip out, I just want to excuse it, and you don't hear no more from me. <laughs> so Chris did his thing. So, so, <laughs> so, yeah, we're all going to be on our best behavior today. Right, uh, we're all going right. to be on our best behavior. Um, so, you get home from Vietnam. It's your first stint in prison. It's the Portsmouth. Well, well, yeah, that was uh, the naval break, and uh, yeah. they couldn't. Uh, I was. Uh, mess up I they couldn't control me what I did I just I was always locked up for getting in fights and stuff I had a lot of rage in me because of what happened and I was still mad with the government because I got screwed and uh it just that's how it just overreacted it took over my thinking mm-hmm. you know and then you get involved what you one thing you learn in Vietnam that you the human life is, un, is there's no value to it after you go through that you go through firefights and stuff like that people get killed you they teach you that there's you know there's no real value to a human life on the other side. And sometimes you just can't shake that. And when they send you back to society, they don't clean that up. They just leave you hanging. And your mentality kind of gets messed up with what it should be. So but. We're speaking with uh, Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadbent, the authors of Choices. You make them. You own them, the Jerry Tillinghast story. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break. And when we come back, if you'd like to join us, you, you can, although we're going to continue I'm going to continue interviewing them, but the phone number will be 508-996-0500. I'm Chris McCarthy. You listen to the Chris McCarthy Show here on 1420 WBSM. We'll be right back.
And good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. Thank you so much for joining me here on WBSM. So I'm speaking with Jerry Tellinghouse and Joe Broadmeadow, who have gotten together. One's a retired police officer and one in his own admissions, a retired criminal. Uh, and central to the story, before we get go any further into, into the organized crime stuff, I do just want to make sure we, we finish up here on the piece on the Vietnam, because, uh, what happened with, with Jerry with his conviction, the way he was treated by the government. Because it is central to this story, and it's important to me because I think there's there's a lot of I know there's a lot of stolen valor out there, and this is quite the opposite of it. If there's any valor that's been stolen, it was by the government of, of this man's valor. Um, so, so I think it's important. And and, and, it, and Joe, who's a retired police officer, Joe Broadmeadow, a lieutenant on the East Providence Police Department, looked at the documents, spoke to the witnesses, knows the government's case now, and so I just want to have him continue we'll, we'll explain a little bit more about what was said about the case after the fact well, with your research. Sure. In, in addition to having spoken to the, the JAG officer who represented Jerry, um, the other thing I did is I pulled the files from the military archives. And there, you know, within the military, the judicial system is similar to the civilian ju- judicial system, but there are significant differences. So first of all, the initial appeal after Jerry's conviction goes to the board that heard the initial case. That was denied. But then uh, it goes to another level. And at that level, Jerry's initial um, discharge from the Marine Corps was listed as a dishonorable discharge, which is the worst level of, of a discharge that you can get. And mm-hmm. it was worse than the other two Marines who actually committed the rape. Um, at that level of appeal, that dishonorable discharge was reduced. So that was one thing. And, and they wouldn't have reduced it unless there was some indication within the file that there was some sort of a miscarriage of justice. Something mm-hmm. was not right about the, that that initial punishment. Secondly, he went to, when he went to the prison, there's a review process there to sort of classify him as what type of a you know a prisoner he's he's classified as dangerous, whatever. And at that level, two officers, two naval officers, reviewed the entire case, and in the documents, now this is in the file that anyone can pull and look. In that file, both officers concurred that the evidence did not warrant the initial case, never should have been charged. They had a difficult time classifying him as a prisoner because uh, they didn't think he deserved to be there in the first place. They really thought that there was a whole um, aspect of his case that was not properly addressed. But at that point, Jerry's a young 19-year-old Marine, um, not necessarily well-schooled in the ways of the judicial system. Uh, You know, Vietnam was ramping up. Uh, There were... There were much more important concerns as far as the military was concerned. So Jerry did his time. You know, he, he stopped the appeal process. He did his time, uh, and and time marched on. But it was interesting is that as Jerry told me the story, and like I, I said from the beginning, I wanted to be able to corroborate anything that he said before I went in the book. Everything he told me about the way that case progressed was documented and was, was um uh, established in the record, in the official record that's maintained by the Marine Corps. So this is not just an angry young man who got involved in something and he was he was he was uh, upset by the way the military you know judged him in the case. This is a, a you know a well documented file, well documented incidents and well documented evidence to corroborate what he was saying. Uh, so then he comes back and it's the title we picked on the book where it says rage, regrets, and redemption. Coming back from Vietnam as 19 years old, Jerry was full of rage. He was angry at the system. He was mad with everybody. Chip on his shoulder. He's a tough guy. Marine Corps taught him how to kill people. Marine Corps taught him how to fight in combat. And as Jerry points out, there were quite a few people who came back from Vietnam who were thrust into combat for 13 months, where essentially each day is a life and death situation. They, as part of any kind of combat, uh, it happens on both sides. The enemy is always demonized. They're dehumanized so that you're not killing a human. You're killing the enemy. Uh, and then you're thrust back into society, and you expect it to survive. And so there were difficult circumstances Jerry found himself in when he returned from Vietnam, and that was very important. Uh, we're speaking with uh, Joe Broadmeadow and jo- Jerry Tellinghast. The book is Choices. You make them. You own them. Uh, you can get it online. You can get it at, at uh, uh, numerous bookstores around. Um they're going to be signing books at, at, at a festival coming up. St. Mary's Feast in Cranston. It uh, starts on the 17th, next Wednesday. Uh, there are various hours for the, for the, during the week. I think it's from 5 to, 5 to 11, and then on weekends it's a little bit longer. But we'll be there for five days signing the book. Anybody's welcome to come down. 
pick up a copy of the book. If you've already purchased a copy of the book, you bought it online and you want to get it signed, bring it on down and we'll be happy to sign it. Beautiful. So, Jerry, um, now you're home you're from Vietnam. You did, you did your time in jail. Can you, well, of course. I'd like to just interject one thing. Yeah. When me and uh, Joe first met, and I was telling him about different things, different aspects that took place in my life. And I told him, I said, Joe. And he agreed at the beginning that, you know, he'll say, before he puts anything in there, he'll check it out to make sure that it's legit. And I says, and I give him six, about six different items. I said, look it, check them out, please. You know, I want you to be satisfied that what I'm telling you is the truth and every one of them was true. I had no reason to lie, you know? No, I, I so... It's important to me that people know that the story again, because it's the opposite of stolen valor. You've had you, what was done to you. You had something stolen from you by the government. You get these guys walking around saying they were in Vietnam or they were in Iraq or whatever, and and it turns out to not be true. Yours is all all true, and worse yeah. because of what the government did to you. Jerry, now you're ho- so now you're home. What what year is it? Well, let's let's do this. You get home. There's racial problems in the country. There's racial problems in Providence. There's things going on. You get home, you go to to the tap room. That was the name of it. Bronx Tap. The Bronx Tap. The Bronx Tap, which happened to be in South Providence. Right. Right. And that's when you 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 knew some of these guys before you went in the Marines, or you didn't know. No. No. How do you end up meeting Jerry Wimet? Oh, well, that was through my father. Okay. What happens? Like I stipulated in the book. I don't want to say too much because, uh, but I met somebody who was uh, supposed to be organized crime guy. You know crap from Shinola, but I was never paying attention to it. It didn't bother me. You know, I was doing my own thing, and uh, he thought I was somebody uh, somebody else that owed him money, and he picked a fight with me, and I knocked him out. I, I told him I would. I said, look, you got the wrong guy. Don't mess with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, well, you guys don't know what you mess with. I said, I don't really care. I mean, you, you put your hands up, and we're going for it. So he did try to assault me, and I, I knocked him out, and then one thing led to another. Then it was supposed to be him, and uh, I believe it's in a book, him and a number of people were looking for me. So I told my father, I, said, I can't sit in the house. That ain't happening. Right. I'm going out there. You know, that's my nature. And so he said, well, let's go talk to somebody. He took me to Bronx Tap and talked to, and that's how I met Gerard then. When we knew the families, because we grew up in South Providence together, but they were older. Okay. And my father had worked, he was a stonemason. He worked with uh, the older brothers that happened to be on a steeple and they fell to their death, which was terrible. But anyway, so he introduced me, so he turns around and he says, well, all right, let's, I'll talk to them. And see. I says, no, I, I, I just like, if you look and tell me about their background, I'll take it from there. Mm-hmm. You know? And I had one friend, uh, a female friend, I don't want to mention her name at this particular time, but she was a very good friend. I knew her family and she was friends of mine. And she also was associated with the certain people. So I, that's how I knew where they were going to be at a certain time. And I approached them. I say, hey, uh, every one of you, one at a time, let's go outside, mm-hmm. you know? And at the time, I still wasn't really involved. I'm just trying to, you know, I don't want nobody look. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder. Right, just That's, get it over with. I'm not trained that way. I was trained to go take action and take it, you know? Right. And it worked itself out, but, you know, you can't trust them anyway. But And that's how partly things started from there. Then the names started getting a little notary. My brothers were up. They were... A couple of them uh, did drugs, but they were always around the streets. They were tough guys, and they went to different places. So the name was, uh, I'd say if they got the right word, synonymous with South Providence. Yep. You know, and uh, so the name wasn't not known, mm-hmm. but it was to me it was, at that time it was known for the wrong reasons. So I decided in my mind, I'm going to clear our name. And, <laughs> you know, I think that was a little different, but <laughs> we cleared it, but it was too much of a step up, you know, but... Uh, and that's what happened. And uh, now there's an incident with your brother that really changes things, right? So Explain you, to people. It, it, this is a crucial point. How I got involved, right? Because I was never even thinking that. Right. And just just broad, give give a broad overview because I I know people want to read it in the book. Let's not ruin it for them. Just give a broad overview of what happened. Well, we were at a diner. It was open for late night, and there was a bunch of people there. So. Uh, Tried was there and other people and uh, my brother Harold I love him God rest his soul but he had a tendency to brag about certain things and one day that night he got called on it and 
when I found out I was with my brother, I just around the back, and I went and I saw him there. He had a weapon. His eyes was big as yo-yos. He was chalk white. I says, what the, what the, Jesus. I said, give me that. Get out of here. Only and he reason, had not been in Vietnam? No. Okay. No. He was in the Army. Okay. Uh, but what happened was uh, I was afraid that whatever it was he was going to do, he wasn't going to follow it through. Right. And they, they, somebody would look to hurt my brother. Then I would have to come out of a right out of Vietnam bag and do what I had to do because I had sniper experience and mm-hmm. you know and uh, it wasn't going to be good. Right. Just say that. But and I didn't really know all the players. But I said, "Listen, go home." So when one person came, not mentioned name, says, uh, "Where's your brother?" I said, "Look, I sent him home. Look, you got me. Don't worry about it." Uh, he was wasn't feeling well. I sent him home, and that's how that started. And uh, it just went from there. You literally take the shotgun out of your brother's hand. And I didn't mention what kind of a weapon. It's in the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, wasn't I didn't there. want to say that. I, I was wasn't there. It's in the book. I wasn't there. Yeah. And I you get it. and you get in the car, and everything's history from there. Yeah. Right. I mean, yep. that's, that's basically the, it's the yeah. crucial point. Yeah. And I, I was uh, kicking myself in the butt afterwards. What you know? But I was afraid for my brother. What he was going to do? They're my older brothers. You know, I had to stick up for them too. You know, because when I needed them, they were there. Even when he used to slap me around, try to make me a tough guy, which I thankfully did. It helped me out. But yeah, as, as we as we get further into the story, if you'd like to call, if you can, please. If you're on hold, stay there. I will get to you. It's five zero eight nine nine six zero five hundred. You, I want to jump forward before we go back again, just so people understand. You did how many years in prison? Roughly thirty three and a half. Over. I did twenty nine. It was almost thirty when I made parole. I was out. Got a. Uh, misunderstand a disagreement with a, a flea market situation I went back and I had to wait for another three and a half years to, to the right time to get it and I uh, got the charges dropped into a, a, a misdemeanor and I pled guilty to that and then they let the pro board let me back out because it wasn't a violent crime uh, folks we're going to take a break here again but when we get back we're, we're going to talk about Raymond Patriarca Senior I'm going to talk about John Gotti, Jerry Wilmette, and, and, and how Jerry Tillinghast knew all of them. And then the other thing is, just b- well, before we take the break, the reason you were able to write this book now is, and felt comfortable writing this book now is, is really why. Everybody's dead. Everybody's dead except you, right? Well, see, I refer to them because they were dead. I'm not looking to bag nobody. I'm never going to hurt anybody to make a dollar. That's not me. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to put somebody's life in jeopardy that has a family. No matter what it is, see, I don't care how many years later. If you do it, it's a capital crime. It calls for life. And I see guys write books and they want to put names out there. This, that, and the other. that pisses me off because there's no reason to do that. They unconsciously uh, put heat on people that are probably retire, don't do nothing, but then they mind their business, they're trying to be with their grandchildren. I couldn't see my way to do that, so that's me. Yeah, you you waited, you, you would, never an informant. No. Never gonna be. Never gonna be. Folks, we, we, we're, we're interviewing uh, Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman, of the book is Choice is the Jerry Tillinghast Story. You make them, you, know, you own them. Before you go, that's, sure. I think that's one of the main reasons that uh, the major that interviewed us in Vietnam because I wouldn't give him a story. I'm the only one that didn't give him a, a statement. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And, and, and I think that pissed him off to the fact of where he says, okay, you get this then. You want to cooperate because everybody else wrote a statement. Right. I wouldn't. Everyone else became an informant. No. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. We'll be right back, folks. Uh, you listen to the Chris McCarthy Show here at 1420 WBSM.
theme song is desperate. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. Thank you so much for joining me. I have in studio, and I'll have them in through the next, uh, till noontime with me, uh, Joe Broadmeadow and uh, Jerry Tillinghast are the authors of the Jerry Tillinghast story, Choices. You make them. You own them. So, now, you knew some of the biggest names in organized crime, it, it, which is part of a American folklore now in, in many ways, but you know it's true. You were there. Right. John Gotti. Respected him very much, liked him very much, for, even for the first time I met him. It's just, it's in awe when you sit back and you listen to them talking. Here's a man that's uh, very well known, very up on uh, the ladder of, we'll say, uh, criminal success mm -hmm. in New York. And uh, the funny part was when <laughs> we went to New York and uh, there was just a couple of us there. And uh, the people, there was like a bunch of people around him all the time. And uh, so he says, uh, where are you guys from? He said, we're from Providence, Rhode Island. I said, holy mackerel, you guys kill everybody down there. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I'm saying, what? I said, yeah, these, you guys are crazy. Right now, here it is, me growing up. Well, anybody growing up with the idea of crime, you think of New York. Come on. You think that's, the, or Chicago, that's the capital, right. you know? Well, when they ever said that about us, I, I, I felt good. Mm -hmm. I say thank you. <laughs> you know, but even though it wasn't totally true, right? It was just that uh, I didn't realize that uh, Rhode Island got that close to things, you know. Right. But when we met him, uh, we was introduced, and my thing is, I always sat back and listened. My theory is, if you want me to know, you'll tell me. If you don't, it's none of my business. I don't want to know it, and I still do that today, you know. But. He was a pretty classy guy. He was, uh, but him and Gerard talked. Uh, sometimes you could hear them talk. Sometimes they didn't talk. Uh, a something took place that is not in the book, and I'm not going to mention it. But he wanted me to stay with him for a month. This so, is John Gotti. Yeah, yeah. So I I thought about it for a second, and uh, people, friends, I was with. I said, nah, that ain't happening. I know. What, <laughs> I just surmised. Uh, he didn't say that uh, nobody knew me, right. so I could get away with almost anything because nobody knew me. I said, no, no, no. I said, uh, no, I can't. I said, I have to, uh, because yes, Gerard. I said, oh, look at you. You he's, uh, it's tough to control because he'll throw people through windows and everything. John said, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, but uh. I uh, I respectfully declined, and he was all right. What did I still say? I have my family, I have to take care of my family. I work for the city. I have to be to work all the time. I says, uh, I can't do it. And uh, Gerard just looked at me like, you know, were you, were you, were you refusing something? You know, mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you know, basically. But it was just a, a great experience. Several times I went back and stopped and said hello. One time, <laughs> I d it's in the book. Right. Uh, I go out. I go to New York for something, and I'm coming back. I see some of the friends that stayed in, the, that were in this club that I had met. I say, hey, how you doing? T tell Johnny I said hello. I get back to New York. Rod gets me, Jerry, I got to talk to you. I saw that, so I go to St. Rocco's. That's where he used to hail. And, uh, Ger Jerry Wimett at... Jerry Wimett, uh, Gerard Wimett, yeah. yeah. At the uh, social club. And uh, St. Rocco's social club, I think it was. Uh, but anyway, he says, uh, who's you? I said, what do you mean? Where was I? Where, why? He said, was you in New York? I said, yeah. He said, what was you doing there? I said, was, I'm, I was doing something there. Mm -hmm. right? what, you know, why are you questioning me? He said, I said, well, John called. I said, he did. I said, well, I didn't see him. He says, that was the point. He said, you stopped. You talked to his people, and you left a message, hello, and everything like that. He said, you tell that big redhead that next time he comes to New York, he don't stop. He's not making it out of New York. <laughs> he was insulted. You didn't come by and see him. No, he felt, yeah, no, yeah. I, no, not in a bad way. Right, right, right. But because uh, I was on, I had to go. I, I just, you know, but uh, had to go. Yes, and uh, it was, <laughs> but it was pretty good. You, you, know? you went down once to see a fight in in, in New York, right, Roberto Clemente? <laughs> How'd that yeah, work what, out? That was with the, we went for uh, Roberto. Uh, he was uh, we went for the fight for the uh, the the Boston guy, the New York, the Garden. What is it, the Garden? I Madison forget. Square Garden, yeah. Yeah, Madison Square Garden. And now, I flew down. My name on the airplane, on the ticket and all that stuff. I'm going there to watch a fight. Me and some friends of ours. So we get there and uh, 
everything's okay. We, the fight's done like this. We spend the night there. Then we go back. Uh, uh, Providence Detectives pulls up in front of a place that I associated with that I was around all the time. My friends, uh, Michael's Lounge in, in Providence, which is half a block to this police station. So something happened. You just have to walk there. It's a simple right. process. They didn't have to come. But anyway, and he opened up his trunk and said, boom. He had a bunch of New York Times papers, and he says, New York wants you for questioning. Evidently, there, when well, I was there, the, this guy Bassett was in the St. Moritz Hotel on the 23rd floor, and either he just thought he could fly or somebody helped him fly. I don't know what it was, but uh, it was, I believe it was a police chief uh, from Warwick called them and says, I did it. I was there. I That's probably the reason why I went. So they had me under investigation for a week. Come over the radio. It says, oh, well, one of the suspects is Gerald Tillinghast. I'm saying, what? You know, so, and when they come and told me that, I see, all right, they want, I said, well, New York wants to talk to us. So tell them, come on over here. Here I am. They right. want me to come and talk to me. They said, well, they, they want you to go to, yeah, right. They got a better shot hitting the lottery without playing it. I said, I ain't going nowhere over there. And uh, I'm driving. And this, this Bassett guy apparently may have had some involvement with organized crime or drugs. Or something what like happened was, what I heard was he, uh, was a drug dealer, and he was going to write a book on how all the drugs were being smuggled into Rhode Island. Hmm. So that's alleged. I, I'm not sure. Right. Uh, but evidently nobody wanted the book to go through, or he just didn't want, I don't know. But anyway. Maybe he thought he could fly that he, day, right? I think so. You know, but he was, t- oh, he was he doing- He couldn't, though. He was doing drugs and everything. You know, sometimes it warps your mind. That's why you don't have to do drugs. Right, right. But, but anyway, so- and, but because he, uh, he couldn't fly, that's right. I mean, he. Well, everybody can fly. They just don't. Everybody can fly. They just can't land. Well, was right. it the fall? It was the sudden stop and got him. That's probably what it was. You know. Right, right, <laughs> right. But you were, you were, you, they never charged you in that case. No, I didn't. No, I was going to say a week later, I'm driving again, and I hear though Tilly has no longer a suspect in the case. As I was accused one week, next week I was not. I was uh, not under the investigation. All this, I didn't even go to New York. I didn't even know it was over the radio. I said, come on. Right, 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 right. Folks, we're speaking with Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman, the author of Choices. You make them, you own them. That's their book about Jerry's Jerry's life. We'll take a very quick break. We'll be right back. You listen to the Chris McCarthy Show. I'm Chris McCarthy here on 1420 WBSM.
All right. Welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. Uh, hey, I want to remind you that Phil will be doing a remote at Handy Hill Creamery. Phil Palologos and WBSM Street Team will be celebrating summer at Handy Hill Creamery on Saturday, July 13th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Handy Hill Creamery is located at 55 Hicksbridge Road in Westport, right on the way to Horseneck Beach. Stop by with the whole family and play cornhole and win prizes. Plus, pick up some amazing homemade treats. It's all happening at Handy Hill Creamery on Saturday. That's this Saturday, July 13th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. PM. Okay, so um, we're going to keep the gentleman here for the next hour as well. We're going to be taking your phone calls at 508-996-0500. Joe, as, as I indicated, people are just tuning in, you're a retired police officer. Um, as you start writing the, a, a book like this, you know, J- Jerry is, of course, possibly, he's been uh, acquitted acquitted in some, some crimes, some famous ones we're going to talk about in the next hour, but he may possibly have jeopardy here, but you also have... Could well, if you knew something, right? Sure. The issue, one of the things that's always a difficult thing when you're writing, when you're writing true stories and you're writing about people who, but, but someone like Jerry who has a, a bit of an active career. And my goal in writing the story was not so much what Jerry did, but why someone like him uh, came from the background that he came from, served in the Marine Corps, how he ended up where he ended up. Now. You know, Jerry freely admits to having made some bad, having made bad choices, and he was involved in some things. He's been accused of a number of different crimes. He's been convicted of a crime that we openly talk about in the book. But my goal was not to un- uncover evidence of new crimes. That's right. not my that's not my responsibility anymore. Uh, these are all, you know historical cases that, but you know that was never my goal. And I and I think it was important that people remember that, you, you know. Um, arresting people for committing crimes is is important. It's mm-hmm. obviously a function of a police, but it, the society at large, the bigger issue is finding a way people get involved in crime in the first place, and ultimately getting to the cause of you know the cause and the involvement. So. All right, we, folks, this is the end of the hour. It went fast. When we get into the next hour, we'll be taking your calls at 508-996-0500. Stick around for the local news and the national news. Tim Dunn will be here with your local news, and I'll be back in the next hour. Stick around.
All right, welcome back to the second hour of the Chris McCarthy Show, the fastest two hours on weekday radio here in southeastern Massachusetts. Appreciate you tuning in. Now, if you'd like to give us a call, you can at 508-996-0500. Uh, before we get back to the story, I want to want to take some calls. We've had some people patiently holding. Uh, we're speaking with Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadmeadow. Rage, regrets, and redemption choices, the Jerry Tillinghast story. Choices, you make them, you own them. You can get this book online. Uh, I can't recommend it enough to you. It just get, get it, get it. It's great, great summer reading. You won't be able to put it down. Uh, I read the thing in one sitting. Uh, it's a very, very readable book really well uh crafted book all right so we're gonna, we're gonna take some phone calls gentlemen you ready yeah ready all right good morning thanks for calling hey how you do- how you doing good um i'm on chapter 14 right now so I, i'm reading the book right now but uh i had a question for you um did you know joe bubbles at all like from you know the patriarch and everything uh that's for jerry sure, did you know uh, joe actually Barbosa? no i never knew him personally it was a no. little bit before my time, but uh, I know that he became an informant, and I know that he got killed, which is a good thing, and uh, <laughs> that's what it is when you do that, you know what I mean? Yeah. He I made agree. a choice, and he paid for it. <laughs> I should have read my book first. He probably wouldn't have, but no, no, that's it. I really didn't know him, and uh, you know, I'm but you, glad. You did know one of the guys he framed, Henry Tamelio. Listen, Henry Tamelio was, was a great guy. I tell you, I felt bad because he was up there in age, and I worked, you were at Walpole with him. I was at Walpole. I got into the diet kitchen so uh, make sure he could get what he needed. And uh, the, he made parole the day he died. Imagine that. I don't know if it was good that way or not, but it was just a, it was a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Yeah. Do you have another I question, Carla? One, one other quick question. Sure. Um, I was reading in the book, too, and I part of the big heist, and they were talking about Rudy Scar- Scarla or whatever that uh, – uh, I guess was they were trying to get him at one point. Rudolph, um, Rudolph Skiera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was wondering if, if he became an informant too. Okay. No, no, he never did. Oh, never okay. did. He was a right. f- very good man. Uh, him and uh, a friend of mine had a little thing going on back and forth and stuff. But I met him when I was incarcerated in the ACI. I knew him a little before that, but I got to know him very well, and I admired him pretty much. You know, he didn't make it where he was being a a rat or a, a weakling. He was a very right. strong individual, and he never ratted on anybody. He died of natural causes in a, one of them uh, homes, I think. Oh, all right. All right. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, thanks for the call. Thanks for the call. Thank so, you. So he's reading the book. Um, yeah, so, so you... Spent time in Walpole State Prison here in Massachusetts. Right, they kicked me out. <laughs> well, they said you go to the prison, right? Yeah, they kicked me out of Walpole. I was supposed to be the toughest joint there was. They kicked me out. They, you And you were at the ACI in Providence? Yes. You were down in Florida in prison? They kicked me out of Florida. They out of, out of Florida. ACI, too. They kicked you out of Florida, too. Yeah. All right. I five, figured if they didn't want me, let me go. Well, I mean, I uh, it, yeah. I felt five, rejection. 508-996-0500. Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Thanks for calling. Yeah, good morning. Hey, I love your guest. And, you know, it's funny. You listen to all these um, politicians, these new ones, talking about what this country is all about and what it's made out of and, you know, who we are as a people. This book and, and your guest is, is what it's all about, right? Did did some things now after Vietnam maybe not so happy about or proud, but, like, understands what this country is all about and said we got to hear from people about, you know, the country is this, and it's made for these kind of... No, it's made for exactly the people, the guests you have on right now, who at least have supported the country, paid their dues for whatever they did wrong. That's that's the people that belong in this country. Thanks for the call. How do you feel about Donald Trump, Jerry? I love him. Yeah. I voted for him because of two reasons. The wall and to beef up our military, protect hey. our, our troops. So here's the thing. I have Sheriff Tom Hodgson in here all the time who who owns two of the biggest walls. Well, the taxpayers own it, but he controls two of the biggest walls in, in Massachusetts. He's got the Bristol County House of Corrections in, in Dartmouth and the New Bedford House of Corrections. And I always ask him, how's your wall doing? Is your wall still working, right? You are behind walls. They really work, right, Jerry? No. Well, they Depending work. on what you're... Well, well in other words, really to keep works. people in or keep people out. Build the wall, right? Well, yeah. What, what I'm saying is, is that you, you know... Well, in, in Norfolk, it was uh, they said it was a medium security. I had a 30-foot wall. 
medium security was about fences and stuff right. like that, but they called it a medium security because it was a step up. Right. You had more freedom inside than you did, like in uh, Walpole itself, which they changed the name to Cedar Junction when I was there. And then uh, the, the lower class of uh, the more restricted areas. Uh, but it wasn't a bad it was, look. Hey, and I don't want you know you don't advocate that the prisons are good, but it wasn't bad. I mean, they tried to do what they could. Some people did, and it's like anything else. The system works, but you have to know how to work it. So you you grow up tough. You go to Vietnam at a very young age. You go to prison from Vietnam when, when you're framed up on a case. You come out. You get involved with this stuff. Your entire life, and then you go into prison, which is an extremely violent place. Your whole life has been in a vortex of violence. How, how did you snap out of it? Well, or did you? A choice. <laughs> I had to make that choice. In other words, I was hurting nobody but myself. I was hurting my family. Mm-hmm. I was hurting a lot of things. That I just felt that, you know, I consider myself being a real, for the sake of words, I'll say a real jerk for what I did for, on my part. I know I, I had better potential. I could have went another way. And... That's where I tried to, on the, on the end, it was uh, rage, regrets. Regrets was ever getting involved. Mm-hmm. Redemption is I try to do what I can periodically here and there. Like if I do a, a, an event or something like that, I'll help raise money for MS or, or for my veterans or something mm-hmm. like that. I try to help where I can. It's little, but it's something to me. I'm trying to give back a little bit. You know? We're speaking with Jerry Tillinghast and, and Joe Broadmeadow. Uh, it's the Jerry Telling Half Story. Choices. You make them, you own them. It's a fantastic book. We're going to continue to take your calls here at 508 996 0500. One of the things that a caller brought up is the bonded vault robbery. And you're one of the few men that were acquitted in that case. Joe, Joe give, give us the, the from, from the police perspective, uh, just a quick overview of that case, what it, what it was. Sure. Well, in a nutshell, the bonded vault was a, uh, was a sort of uh, quasi secret facility um, used for people to to store ill-gotten gains, you know, stolen goods, cash generated that they don't want the government to know about, whatever it may be, weapons. Um, but it was, a, it was a secret, but it wasn't the best kept secret in the world. Uh, depending on what version you believe, um, Raymond Patriarca either controlled it or he was just so aware of it that, uh, you know, he was able to orchestrate this thing. The The genesis of the case was that Patriarca had been in prison, and part of the deal of being in prison is you get, your family is taken care of by the people on the, on the outside. Um, Patriarca did perceive that that was not being done. So they orchestrated this robbery, essentially, of these these uh, safe deposit boxes. And a team went in, group of, of men went in, six guys went in, and uh, took the, two, the people inside the place uh, at gunpoint, um, controlled them, and then they broke all the safe deposit boxes open. And again, at the you know, depending on the numbers you believe, uh, at the time the numbers were three to four million dollars in cash, and jewelry and gold. Um, but those were very conservative estimates. The reality is it was probably closer to thirty or forty million, which in today's dollars would be one hundred and forty million. Um, it was a lot of stuff. Uh, they got the six guys involved got cash. For the uh, for the robbery, they each got about sixty four thousand dollars in cash, and then the rest of the stuff went the way of defenses. Um, in our book, we say that it went to New York, and because that would make that sen- make sense. That's a lot of money to get a lot of gold to get rid of in Rhode Island. Uh, taking it to New York makes a lot more sense. Um, it it's considered to be the second largest heist in in U.S. history. It's a huge amount of money. And they and they made a movie about it. So Tim White has written a book about it. We've interviewed here. We've interviewed Tim Tim on the air a couple of times about his book. And then they, they just came out with a movie. I'm not sure if it's still in in the theaters down in Rhode Island. Still, the name I, of the movie I think is, it is still in, The Vault. Yeah, I think it's still in the theaters, and it's also out in uh, pay per view. And, and so it's, it's it features Chaz Palmer, which some of you people know from The Bronx Tale. It's got Don Johnson in it, well, formerly of Miami Vice, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, he plays Gerard w- Womet. Uh, Jerry, you went to the... Uh, well, tell us tell us about your, your involvement with the movie. Well, I don't want to say... Which is about you. Well, the guy that played my character was uh, Nick Principe. I met, he was six foot nine. So when I met him, I'm looking up, I said, Jesus Christ, I grew quite a bit. <laughs> and then... But there was other parts of the movie. I don't want to say for people who haven't seen it yet. Right. 
Uh, I want them to see it. They can get their opinion, and uh, they can get back to you. You get back to me. I can tell you what it should have been. And, oh, part of it was good. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so they had the <laughs> they had the red carpet where the actors came, and they were debuting the, mule, the movie, and a friend of mine called me. Uh, said, they're going to have the red carpet there. Now, I'm over there. I wear regular clothes. I was... Uh, I was doing something, so I was right. I was actually eating dinner, and when I got the call, I saw it was going to start around six o'clock. This is the red carpet premiere. He said, "But you're not invited." I said, "What, what do you mean I'm not invited?" I said, they use my character, you know. But I turned around. I said, "Okay." I turned. I said, ah, "Frank, this." I went right up there, crashed it, yeah. and and when I got there, they went. They were a little crazy. They were a little, I went over well. But the actors were coming up to me, say, "How good did we do? How close were we to this? How close were we to that?" You know, um, it no, it's 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 a funny story. It really, really is, and it's interesting. It's interesting. You're one of the few people acquitted in the case. Yes, I was. Uh, but there was three acquitted. Okay. Uh, the other two passed away. Well, one uh, died of lead poison. The other one, I think, it was cancer in his heart. But uh, I'm the only one left. You're the only one left, which Out is why you can six. write the book. Which is why you can write the book. Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm gonna. I put it, a lot of things. You I, still maintain your innocence, though, in the case. Absolutely. Even though it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you tell somebody that, I don't think there's a law enforcement agency that believes it. Or I don't think there's, a, they just think, well, I got lucky, and and, and that's it. You know what I mean? But it, it's, it's funny. I mean, I laugh, I get it, but I was acquitted. He and, was acquitted. Uh, he was acquitted. Folks, let's go back to the, guys, we're going to go back to the phones. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi, uh, yes, uh, there's a new name, I guess, in the race for mayor. Is that correct? Hey, sir, sir I'm, I'm in the middle of an interview with, with, with an author. Um, I, I don't know about the mayor's race, but we can get back to that uh, tomorrow. We'll be happy to talk about that. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Thank you for taking the call. Thank you. Um, I, uh, there's a book that I couldn't put down, and it had to do with one of our locals. I'm sure this gentleman has a lot of stories. He, he could take a show up, probably. Uh, Joe Barboza. Uh, anything he can fill in because my dad grew up with him and went to school with him until he quit school. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Thanks. So, so, so Joe Bowser, as you mentioned the earlier, call you, you and Joe never. Thank God for you because you probably would end up. Well, you ended up in prison anyway. But he, he was setting guys up. Well, that um, would have been interesting. It would. Yeah, that would have been interesting. <laughs> but you knew you knew some of the guys that he framed. Yeah. In, in, in the case. Yes, I did. It, and. Uh, I don't say this in a bad way. I'm not trying to disrespect nobody, especially to the caller that just called in, but I would appreciate it if you told your father that he shouldn't idolize that guy because he was a rat. He got what he deserved, and that's what happened. So, you know, what he could have been honorable at one time, but he turned he turned around, ratted on people. He ratted on police officers. He ratted on everybody. So, uh, and made things up, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. Of course, he fabricated a lot. A lot of things on and, behalf uh, of the FBI. And uh, But he got killed, and it was a good thing. Yeah. Shot to death in the streets of San I think, Francisco. I think that's one of the important aspects of this of this story, is you know because in the book we talk about how Jerry's brother was, we believe, wrongfully convicted in this in the case where Jerry was actually convicted is when Jerry was convicted. But when you look at it from the big perspective now of seeing what happened with Whitey Bulger, mm -hmm. the, the involvement of the FBI there, in the Henry Tamelio case. Um, there were four guys who were involved in that original conviction for a uh, Teddy Deegan murder, uh, and they were not guilty. I mean, I'm not saying that they were good guys, because no. they weren't, but they weren't guilty in that case, and that's the way the system's supposed to work. But Bozo was uh, essentially committed perjury under the hand with the handling of the FBI, and his, his testimony was corroborated by a guy named Paul Rico, who was an FBI agent. Right. So that's a troubling aspect of these things. You start to see, when you look at it from a historical perspective, you know, a lot of people will look at Jerry's case and say, well, he's just trying to make excuses for his brother. Well, taken, iso taken in isolation, you might be able to make that argument. But when you look at the big picture of what happened all across the U.S. and in terms of cases, in particular, like Henry Tamelio, who was not also not guilty of that case. Again, not defending the guy. Right. But... Uh, guy who spent essentially died in prison for a crime that he did not commit that's not the way the system's supposed to work it's not the way the system's supposed to work whatsoever you know, can i just check something of course about my brother in other words 
And we're going to talk about that case when we come back from okay. the commercial break, all right. uh, because it, it's another one. It's the reason that Jerry was was in prison for all the for for all those years. Uh, but you, we'll, we'll be right back. You listen to the Chris McCarthy Show here on fourteen twenty WBSM. Stick around. You, oh, you can call us at five zero eight nine nine six zero five hundred. We'll be right back. All right. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we are taking your phone calls at 508-996-0500. Um, we're restricting the conversation to, to our guest, which is Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadmeadow, who are the authors of Choices. You make them, you own them. It's the Jerry Tillinghast story about Jerry's uh, life. I, I t- folks, I read the book in one sitting. Run out and get it. You're going to love this book. You're going to appreciate that you read it. You can d- get it online. If you're one of those Kindle people, you can download it uh, as well. And then they're going to be signing uh, books. 
coming up at a, at a festival. Where are you going to be? Uh, St. Mary's Feast in Cranston. St. Mary's Feast in Cranston is uh, the 17th through the 21st. So, it's, it's, so during the week and everything, you guys will be there all week? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, Jerry, the case that puts you in prison for 33 years is the murder, is a murder case that you and your brother were convicted in. Right. Explain if, what, what happened. Well, it started out to where uh, it was supposed to be bookies. We were told that uh, we're going to go and see, rob two bookies. Let's just put it that way. They were they ain't supposed to have a lot of money. So, okay, so it was mentioned to bring George. George Bedmajor. Yeah, because he was my friend, and I'm probably the only one that could have got him to do it. Okay. So I'm not paying attention to it. I said, why? You know, this well, might need to do it back up. Okay. So we had George. We're going. We meet and everything like this. Now, we went in his car. Left my car in front of Michael's lounge. So we're going, we're proceeding to whatever we have to do. And we had a spot where we were changing cars. And uh, ironically enough, see, when when we started, we are being followed. My theory was always this. You, if you think you're being followed, go up a one-way street. By law enforcement. By law enforcement. That's what you're being followed, right. yeah. Yep. Uh, you go up a one-way street. Either way, doesn't matter who. <laughs> right. If they follow you, then you know there's something to watch out for. Right. Well, that's so, true. But if they follow you, 90% of the time, law enforcement is going to pass it. They're not going to follow it. They're not going to break that law. It's a city law. They're not going to break going up a one-way street, but they would have committed themselves. Right. So and then you lose them. And then, but, it's a tip what, for you kids out there. Huh? That's a tip for the kids out there. No, it's not. It's not <laughs> a good kidding, one. I'm kidding. Yeah, it's not a good one, though, right? No. The tip is don't do crime. Right. Uh and anyway, so we wound up going to where we were changing the vehicles. And lo and behold, one of the uh, investigators was there. Like, it was like, you just come out of, boom. Nobody ever knew. No, it was only three people talked about where we were going to do this, do that. So what happened was, I believe that they had found their information through a, a, a place that we met. It was bugged. And they didn't want to admit it. They played it off, and I don't blame them. That's their business. That's what they do. So anyway... So we're going and... Uh, no, they were using illegal audio surveillance on you and just wouldn't admit it in the case. Absolutely. Right. Well, if they would, did that, then they would have blew the case probably. Right, because so, they weren't supposed to... Yeah. Right. So anyway, so we're going and uh, we're on our airport connector. Skippy Burns, because he passed away. I had to wait 40 years. Uh, I would never bag him because they had my brother and I'm not going to... It is... It's a sad situation, but it is what it is. You know, when you you go by a certain code, it, it costs you. And it's, uh, but anyway, so we're making a turn and all of a sudden Skippy turns around and shoots George. I said, what the, I won't swear. I Thank said, you. What, what's going on? And I started yelling. He says, I was ordered to do it. I was ordered to do it. And we couldn't go. I had to keep driving and stuff like that. So we got to where we're going. We parked the car. So we met us. We got in the car. We left. And I'm glad in one sense that I did get arrested that night because what I was going to happen because I know I got set up. And he got set up, mm-hmm. and uh, I wasn't going to be happy about it. Right. And uh, it would have been, maybe you wouldn't have been talking to me today. Right. But maybe a couple of people would have passed away quicker. Right. But it was going to be where uh, I needed justification for that, but I never got it. So you and your brother both get sentences. Yeah. Your brother didn't do the crime. No. What happened was we got we went to the place where we got arrested at uh, Michael's Lounge. Uh, the detective, uh, uh, the, uh, well, the state police uh, detective and uh, the FBI agent, they came in. Now I'm there. They turned around. They put me up against. They put me up against the wall. They said, "Yeah, my, my brother's supposed to be. He's supposed to be in the car." They walk right by him. They had their backs to him and anything. Mm-hmm. They take me out, and he's still there. Right. So they turn around, and I told my brother as we we're going, I said, "Do not move from this table. Right. Stay right there." I said, "Paul, keep him there." But my brother's my brother. That's your lawyer, right? Yeah, Paul. He happened so, to be there that night. He was there that night. What happened? Right. And uh, the thing of it is, and uh, he could have been a good witness for everybody, but my brother, because he didn't want to take a shot that it would affect me, he didn't want to use him. And Paul, we would, we would tell him, "Look, please use him. Use him. If you get away, that's great too. You know mm-hmm. what I mean?" Mm-hmm. So, and we go out, and we're getting ready to go, and uh, the FBI guys just come on. We got the one we want, and uh, state police officer said, "Oh, we need one more." My brother opens the door. Because they were door. doing surveillance on you at the time. There were two people in the car. Well, three people three. in the car. But now there's one guy. Badmajian is dead in the car. The police have found him at this point. Right. Right. So when they found him, when they come back to the car, 
there was a blind spot. There was a blind spot on a connector. I guess they couldn't see it. So when they saw the car again, it was only only saw two people. So according to what they said, they thought somebody that he got out of the car and did something. But anyway, so uh, when my brother stuck his head, I said, "Where are you going?" I said, oh, "My heart fell." I said, ah, "Jesus," and it's you come too, and that's how that happened. And they lied. Big time. They knew that he had nothing to do with it. He mm-hmm. passed every test he could take because they figured, I think, that I would have gave up who it was to save my brother. Mm-hmm. And I, I, each be up today, but I couldn't do it. Right. And I even told my brother, I said, I wouldn't even tell him anything about the situation. I said, uh, just in case, you never know. Yeah. Uh, I said, but I says, I can't, I can't. I'm sorry, but I can't. I told you, don't leave the table. Right. I'll tell uh, you an interesting thing. When Jerry told me that story, <clears throat> when he finally told me the whole story about what happened and who had been in the car with him, uh, my first reaction was, this is not accurate. This can't be true because Skippy Burns was convicted in the Bond and Vault robbery mm-hmm. and was sentenced to life in prison. Now, the kid, the Bond and Vault trial was in 76, 77. This is in 1978. How is a guy who was convicted and sentenced to life in prison out on the street? Can't be. Right. Couldn't happen. Wrong. The records reflect that Burns... <sighs> And John Womet, and uh, one of not not uh, Chucky Flynn was also convicted. He was not released, but but Womet and Burns were both allowed out on bail pending an appeal. Now that's unheard of, and that just reflects back on the kind of influence the organized crime had within Rhode Island. They went judge shopping. Uh, they they waited for the prosecutor to be, at that point the prosecutor was a guy named DeRobio had been appointed to the bench he, he was no longer with the attorney general's office the assistant prosecutor was a guy named John Murphy a great prosecutor but he was on vacation and so they shopped for another prosecutor who looked at the case was it's a robbery case what's the big deal got a sympathetic judge who put these guys out on bail so now Jerry's telling me this guy is in the car that I didn't think could be in the car, but in fact he can be in the car. He bears a striking physical resemblance, a bit of a physical resemblance to to um, Harold, who is Jerry's was brother. Harold's yeah. brother, Harry's br- Gerald's brother, Jerry's brother, and you know the rest is rest is history. We're going to go to the phones, folks. We're speaking with uh, Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman, the author of "Choices You Make Them, You Own Them," and all of those stories that we're talking about are in in the book, and and they're in much better detail, obviously. So I encourage you to go out there and check it out. Good morning. Thanks for calling. When will the guest go off? The caller earlier had a topic. I'm- that guy's a nut. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Uh, good morning. Jerry, I might give you his name. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm retired. <laughs> Hi. Good. Um, I just want to know the title of the book. I think I missed it. If I, go, walk, in a, if I walk in a bookstore, what should I ask for? Ask for a, the book by Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman called Choices, the Jerry Tillinghast Story. Choices, you make them, you own them. Make them you, choices, you make them, you own them. Okay. I got a couple of questions for Jerry. Uh, sure. Uh, one of them maybe he won't answer, but uh, I'll get the general opinion, his general opinion, and then I'll make my own decision. Uh, the casinos, uh, organized crime in the uh, local casinos around here? I have no clue. I don't. I can't go to a casino because I'm on parole, so I don't have the luxury of figuring that out. I would think today, I wouldn't think so because there's so much security and it's so, it's so. It's just so different. I don't see that happening because there are uh, tons of law enforcement that work there, uh, retired police and stuff like that, and they're not going to let that go on. So I, 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 I say no. Uh, do they hang around the casinos? Well, everybody hangs around everywhere. I mean, it's not that they haven't been there or wouldn't go there. I have no clue, but, I mean, you could assume they go there, but I wouldn't know for sure because I don't go there. So I yeah. wouldn't have the opportunity to see anybody. Okay. A personal question, though. Um when you were hanging around these guys, uh, are they paranoid? Because it seems like, uh, you know, uh, afraid of getting whacked or something, or well, sit, sitting in the front seat and somebody sitting in the back. <laughs> well, they can only get paranoid if they have a guilty conscience. See, if they have a guilty conscience, they shouldn't get in the car to begin with because so, they might have talked about somebody and somebody know about it. And I'll give you an example. One time, a long time ago, it was in the middle of the blizzard. I saw a friend of mine walking down Valley Street. I said, let me give you a ride. He said, oh, no, I'm only going up here. It was at two miles to go. 
I said, come on. He, he was, <laughs> I figured in my mind, he must have said something about me somewhere and thought I heard about it. And, but I was just wanting to give him a ride. And uh, it just didn't happen. So I said, oh, okay, hey, keep going. You know, but it, it, it is, the people do get paranoid. But I, my firm belief is uh, you're not going to get paranoid if, if your mind's in the right place or if you didn't do anything to, for somebody to retaliate to. So you would say they're happy-go-lucky, guys? Well, not all happy-go-lucky. I mean, uh, you never know what they might think where something might take place while they're in the car, but not directly aimed at them. You now things happen, you know? Like what happened to you. Right. Exactly. I mean, you call it thanks for the call. I mean, in other words, you're in the car with Bad Majian, and yeah. now it turns out Skippy Burns, and you had no idea. And they, Listen, his, they whack Skippy Burns, what, and you do 33 what, years what for What bothers it. me oh, is whack, uh, his Bad daughter and his family uh, believed it, I had something to do with that, the way it went down. I was there. We did what we did, but it wasn't for that. And that was uh, beyond my understanding and comprehension, beyond my control, because I didn't know what was going to happen. If I knew it was going to happen, that wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. You know, but, and I feel bad for his daughter and, and, and his ex-wife and stuff and his family. I just, it was what it was, because he was a good friend of mine. I would never do that to a friend. We're speaking with Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman, the author of Choices, You Make Them, You Own Them. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Good morning. I'm just calling to find out where can we find this book. Okay, so you can get it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. Uh, Walmart stores have it. Um, any of any local bookstore can order it. Uh, All also, right. Do you know if it's on audio books or anything it like is that? On, it is in fact on audio as well. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you guys very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. And of course, you guys again will be will be you'll be able to take care. Uh, Meet Jerry and, and Joe. Uh, where? The okay. feast. So it's a St. Mary's feast that's coming up uh, July 17th to the 21st. And we'll be right on the street. So you'll be able to walk right by. You'll see the big signs and stuff. We'll be there with the books, me and Joe. And at the risk of confusing people, it's it's St. Mary's in Cranston. St. Mary's in Cranston on Cranston, Phoenix Island. Avenue in Cranston Street. And if you have a book that you purchased and it's not signed, please bring it by. I'll sign it for you. No problem. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Yes, gentlemen, thank you both for coming on the show, and um, thank you, Chris, for getting them in here. You know, Thanks. both of you from different sides of the same candle, it's not even the top or the bottom. Um, even though you're both retired and all that, you both come across a lot of people who did a lot of bad things in life, and that feeling of um, not looking over your shoulder, but just kind of once in a while, that sense of, I wonder if that guy across here is looking at me kind of funny, what's wrong? Do you ever shake that? Well, I'll tell you where that, that came from. Go ahead. I'll tell you where that came into play was when I was doing time, I was always worried about somebody trying to get even with me and retaliate on one of my children and would have set me off to like skyrockets. But uh, f- thankfully that never happened. And uh, I wasn't worried about it. And I'm not saying this being uh, sarcastic or being uh, egotistical or anything, but 90% of the people that I dealt with have all passed away. Natural causes, of course. You... Uh- <laughs> That's a broad version of natural causes. Well, in fact, in fact, you were uh, you were uh, attacked in prison. I mean, there's a story. In oh, the we had book- a, uh, there was gangs going on in prison. Yes, I. It was a misunderstanding. I got stabbed in the back of the neck. I got him with a sharpened license plate. Right. I mean, if you're going to be stabbed in prison, it should have a license plate involved. Why not? Sure. Right. 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 It should put a sticker on it to uh, <laughs> make sure it's a for that year. Right. But the thing of it is, uh, uh, unfortunately, I was capable of my combat experience, my street experience. I got up, I jumped up, and I got him. But I lost a lot of strength in my left arm. I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And But that happens. You know, like anything else, it's a part of prison. You know, they say you can't put weapons in prison. Anything, any, I don't care if it's a pencil. Anything in, in, in prison environment is a potential tool for a weapon. Mm-hmm. And it, it's hard to get away from that. I'll tell you something else interesting that the caller brought up about, you know, the reaction to writing the book Mm -hmm. from my perspective. And I I kind of anticipated there would be some negative reaction from some police officers because they would look at me and say, why are you writing a story about a bad guy? But quite frankly, the reaction has been almost all positive with a few exceptions. But it's been mostly all positive because most police officers want to know the truth. They want to, Mm -hmm. and they, and they don't want to make a mistake and they don't want to, um, put somebody in jail who doesn't deserve to be there. So while some people have taken exception to me writing the story and why are you trying to glorify or, 
you know, uh, apologize for Jerry's actions, which is not what the book is about. And it, 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 that but. does not come across. This is no, by the way, folks. If you've got a kid at home, a, a teenage boy or a coming of age kid who's 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 trying to be a knock around guy, give him this book and make him read it. I mean, th- this this book because it's got your children are in this book, and, and my listeners know your son Jared. I've had him on the show a couple times. The kids are in the book. What their life was like in the book. The only who, before we take a break, Jerry, and then we'll leave. Who, who's the only person that ever shot you? Oh, you ought to go there, right, Chris? This was doing good, and I have no. I wasn't using any profanity. I'll just make sure there were no pencils in front I'm gonna of you. I'm going to get you I... all bleeped up over here. Uh, my second wife shot me in the knee. It's in the book, folks. We'll be right back. You listen to the Chris McCarthy Show. Thanks, Chris. You're, on, you're welcome. A 1420 WBSM. We're selling books, Jerry. We're going we're gonna to tell it all, good, bad, and otherwise. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. We have Joe Broadmeadow and Jerry Tillinghast, the authors of the Jerry Tillinghast story, which is called Choices. You make them, you own them. It's available online. Uh, it's available in, in, in numerous bookstores. Uh, if if they don't have it, on, they'll, they'll order it for you. Uh, but it, you run out and get it. You, you're going to absolutely love it. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Yeah, hi. Hey. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, I tried to get the book a couple of weeks ago after you mentioned it, and I went to Barnes & Noble. They don't carry it. They have to order it for you, just so everybody knows. Yeah, the one. Well, where did I get mine? I got my receipt. I got mine in Middletown. Yeah, Middletown. Right? Yeah, they'll order it for up, you. I ended up going online. I got it anyway. Anyway, I thought the book was great. I was just wondering, from Jerry's point of view, I know down here in New Bedford, from personal experience, that there were ties many years ago, maybe in the '60s and '70s, to the Providence guys. Uh, a lot of big sports booking operations, as well as other things. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine that I grew up with actually had a very big sports booking thing. I'm not talking tens and twenties. I'm talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars at night. And the way they got him was <laughs> they raided his house when he wasn't home, but his wife was. And they charged him with uh, having an illegal sports book. They found automatic weapons, and they also found drugs. So what they did was they tracked him down and said, here's the deal. Your wife's going to jail for a long time unless you come forward and uh, confess, which he did, and he ended up in Walpole. But I'm just wondering, does Jerry have any stories about connections in this area, New Bedford? This guy actually lived on Skarnica Neck, right where you are. Well, thanks for the call. Not in New Bedford, because I am not from Massachusetts, and I never really circulated through Massachusetts. I stuck primarily in Rhode Island, but they had similar situations in Rhode Island, and that's what they do, and that's their job. Are we going to look at it properly, and we don't like it, but it is what it is. I mean, they'll arrest everybody in the family to put pressure on the one individual say, look, well, they're going to jail too because they're going to be part of it unless you say what's going on. And the person 90% of the time stands up and said, yeah, it was me, and then it goes there. But I think the way that happens to get the information is that you have to get it through. Somebody has to tell somebody What's going on? Another way they get it, if they, if you're under a little bit of a highlight, they tap your phones because their phone company works with them. And if people think that's not happening, then they're delusional. They ought to, you know, go see their doctor, get some good medication <laughs> because that's what they do. And they're so yeah, sophisticated today, you don't even know. They're grabbing people out of college. And it's just, it is what it is. The main thing, hey, don't do it. Or use somebody else's phone somewhere else. <laughs> I, but you, you can't just, you got to assume that uh, there's a, an informant somewhere. Maybe somebody had a big bill, couldn't pay it, so he turns around and gives up the guy. Uh, but that works the same way in Rhode Island. It was the same thing. Uh, people get jealous and they just give up information. But the cops, they're, they're on the job. I mean, they know what's going on. It's not like they're right around and they're stupid. They know what's going on. 15% of all law enforcement. A crooks, as far as I'm concerned. Fifteen, you said. About fifteen. Yeah. It's a little number. All across yeah. the board. Not crooks in a way that they they act like jerks or whatever the case might be. But you have the other eighty five percent that really try to make a difference, and you have to give them a little bit of respect. Whether you don't or you don't want to or not, too bad. It's got to be done. Um, hey, folks, I just want to remind you, we have our 50s night. It returns to downtown New Bedford on Thursday, July 18th. We'll have live entertainment and hundreds of antique cars are going to fill the streets for a family friendly night of nostalgia. Um, so head on down. It's going to be uh, from 5 to 9 p.m. Thursday in downtown New Bedford, July 18th. I want to thank uh, Cottage Street Motors, Captain's Place, Avalon Medical Spa, Southeast, South Coast Health, Gaspar Linguises, uh, Cove Surf and Turf, Market Basket, Joe Costello Real Estate, Empire Ford. Again, Cottage Street Motors, uh, Melody Bonanno of Calibre Home Loans. A portion of the proceeds are going to go to Mercy Meals and more in honor of Joe Jesus. Again, 50th night, Thursday, July 18th. What was Raymond Patriarca like, Jerry? To me, it was like a... Surrogate father. I tell you, I love the guy. I met him when he first came back from, I think, in Georgia. He did finish five years. He had to come to Rhode Island for five years. So he was doing some, a conspiracy or whatever it was. And most naturally, most naturally uh, I went, I, I was a porter, which is outside. I, You know, you keep the area clean and stuff like that. You give you a little run of the building or that area. And uh, when they put him up in the cell block and I went up to him and asked him if he needed anything and... Uh, introduced myself and who were with and so he knew I had already known I didn't know but and I and that's how I got to talk to him and I'd go by and talk to him periodically and he, he but he used to go outside in the yard and this used to get me because he'd be outside and he'd have no peace 
everybody be coming up to him. Blah, blah, blah. And I used to just stay in the background. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask him nothing. And he asked me about that one day. He says, let me ask something. He said, everybody else asks, asks questions or something. How come you don't? I said, well, if you want me to know something, you're going to tell me. Other than that, it's none of my business. And he says, can you go out there and tell the rest of the people? I said, listen, I'll go out there and tell them anything you want. I said, they're going to be mad, but you're going to, everybody's going to be complaining to you later, you know, right. but if you want me to, I will, you know. Right. But it's just that afterwards, in other words, in my mind, if I can walk into his office and he hugs me, where else are you going? Right. What else? You know right. what I mean? Not a lot of people make it, I think since the Godfather movie, popcorn gangsters have been coming out, out of the woodwork. And, but the thing of it is, a lot of people don't realize if you're in that racket or something that, if you're going to do it, if you're going to be bad, be good at it. That's a slogan I started with Crime Town. But the thing of it is, do it out of love and respect for whoever you're with. If you, people do it with greed, they want the greed, and that's where they get in trouble. They get too greedy. Next thing you know, uh, they're in. They're, they're seeing their doctor. <laughs> seeing their doctor. And, uh, we're, but, speak, we're speaking with Jerry Tillinghast and Joe Broadman, the, the author of Choices, a Jerry Tillinghast story. You make them, you own them. Uh, Jerry, just just to finish up, because I want to move through as many calls here as possible, but that gentleman meant, said, said, you know, you said, look, you didn't come over to New Bedford. It wasn't your area. But you, you and we're not going to say any names, but you do know guys from New Bedford you did time with up at Walpole. Yeah. So you know guys from the area. I met them, yeah. Yeah, met them, Fall River guy, all kinds of people around. Yeah. yeah. I didn't hang with them. No. No, you just, but. But you, uh, but it's you, nice to know them, friends, you know, and a uh, right. couple of very good guys. Yeah, from this area. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, folks, we have to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. Stick around if you're on hold. We're going to try to get to you. Uh, we'll be right back.
All right. Welcome back to the show. I'm Chris McCarthy. This is the Chris McCarthy Show. I'm speaking with Joe Broadmeadow and, and Jerry Tillinghast. The book is Choices, the Jerry Tillinghast story. You make them, you own them. It's about Jerry's uh, life in organized crime, although never really convicted of an organized crime thing so much, right? They never committed you. you know, they tried to, <laughs> they call me an enforcer. Right. So I, 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 I went with this. I said, listen, I, I'm not, if I'm an enforcer, then you're an enforcer. It's how do you figure that? Is it because you have a family? Yeah. Do you set up certain rules? Yeah. What happens if they break the rules? Well, they get punished. There you go. There you go. Uh, so you're an enforcer too. You enforce the policy. You enforce the rules. No. But I never got convicted of that. No. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Hey, good morning. Great. Morning. Two hours I was, I was listening to. Thank you. I tried to get the book on Amazon, but it's only available in, in paperback. Is there a hardcover version too? No. No. Just hardcover. Just right. paperback. It, was, it wouldn't cost too much, and we didn't want to charge people uh Crazy money. It wasn't right. worth it to us. We didn't want to do that. But, uh, let me ask you guys a few questions. Um, real cl- real Joe, tight question. Joe, did you ever meet or or uh, hear about Michael Corbett, a, a Willow Springs, Illinois police chief who got caught up in corruption? I do. I do. Yep. Okay, and um, Jerry. Yes. The stuff that I'm hearing from you, man, you were involved in some dark things in your life. I want to ask you a serious question. It's not a threat. Please don't take it that way. Are you ready to die and meet God and, and explain this? All right. Uh, we're, 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 Jerry, you don't have to answer that. Not, I, I was going to say, well, number one, uh, he's not mine. I'm a Wiccan. Right. right. I believe in uh, God right. and goddess. And, and uh, do you know, G- listen, that's the other thing you're going to read about this book. And we're coming to the end of the show. I can't believe it. But there's all kinds of things in this book for everybody to read. And, and you're, you you pre-practice Wiccan, not, right. not, not Christianity or, or, no. or any other religions. I was baptized a Roman Catholic, but uh, it just wasn't for me. I don't begrudge anybody what they do. That's this beautiful. It just didn't work for me. Right, right. All right, hey, folks, listen. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. Thank Jerry, you, Jerry. Really appreciate it, Joe. Joe, and you've got other books out as well. I do. I actually have six books out altogether. Four of them are fiction books, and uh, there's another nonfiction book called... Uh, Unmade. Uh, it's also based on a uh, crime town. Absolutely. Great book. We'll be back. I'll be back tomorrow. Stick around, folks.